We are women. We are sweeping the hearth. We are dreaming. Say a couple words. No. This is Krista Drake. She's joining me. I'm the quiet one, so I'm just gonna say uh, it's great to be here. <laughs> so before we start, I just want to thank uh, Mama Key for this beautiful day and supporting us as we move forward with uh, our rights and, and our voices. Uh, miigwech, what do you do? We're going to start with a strong woman song.
Um, and so I'm just going to tell you the first one, and it starts with my own life, um, my story as a woman. So I, I want to tell you that my dad used to tell this story, that uh, when I was born, he would tell me that he was so disappointed because I was born a girl, and he had only wanted sons. And then he would say this, he would say, then I held you, and I never felt anything like that before in my life. And I was born as a change agent. I came into this world to challenge my dad, and I ended up becoming his best friend. Um, I challenged him, I made him see the world through my eyes, I talked to him about things that he didn't want to hear, birth control, abortion rights, why women burn bras, why women go on sex strikes, why women march, why women have buildings. Um, when I became a parent, I was so happy to have two daughters. And they came here to challenge me, and they both were born as change agents. Now the past few years, my daughter Kaden and I have been having candid conversations about gender identity. And my eyes have been open to my own privilege and power as a cisgender woman who doesn't need to question if there is space for me in meetings, in marches, and access to facilities. I've been confronted with reality of the seemingly entrenched either or genderized culture that makes no room for anyone who does not identify as one or the other because there's more. There's more identities and there's more truths. So for me, I've been able to share stories with Cayman about the conditions I grew up with, the way men commented openly on women's bodies, walking through unsafe school hallways, feeling unsafe at all times, and the way no one expected much from me. And the stories on why it was so important for me to challenge these things, first with myself, then with my family, and then with my community. I shared these stories to reach greater truth, to reach for an understanding of what it has meant to be a woman, and to understand that what that means for my daughter, who is not only my daughter, but also my son. I share these stories to understand how we cannot be afraid of our own stories, or use our stories to diminish each other, but to find ways to stand together. So many times, um, people with name recognition will get asked to speak, and I'm very honored to be here today and speaking. And yet, we have all of these amazing people in our community who might not have that same name recognition, but we need their voices because they are organizing, and they are making way for us to move forward. And so I want to invite Kamen Goodsky. Kamen goes out on a weekly basis and speaks to schools and across our region talking about the issues that um, that she deals with, and I just want to invite Kamen up to the mic to speak. Hello, my name is Kim Gutsky. My pronouns are she, her, his, him. I don't respond to lady or man. If you happen to call me that, I'll just go, nope. Um, first, I would like to say thank you to my beautiful and awe-inspiring mother for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Um, and. It's an honor to be here with all of you lovely individuals. I'm happy that we're gathered here to support and empower women on this march together. Um, but as we march together, we feel this beautiful power in being in one crowd. We need to take this momentum and keep pushing forward for greater changes in our schools, workplaces, homes, and communities. And in order to create real change, we need to invite all the people to the table, especially women of color and members of the LGBTQ community. <laughs> Equality starts by including, not excluding. So I ask you to ask yourself right now, am I actively including all the voices that need to be heard, or am I shutting them out? Am I doing everything that I could be doing to hear everyone? There's lots to be worked to be done in this new year and beyond, but I believe we can accomplish and overcome a lot together. Um, and that's my message. Be glad for letting me speak, and I hope that we can move forward to a greater future. And I'm proud of you to stand with me, and I'm proud of you to stand with you. And when I was asked to speak, I said yes, and then I thought about standing here by myself, and I said, I asked if I could speak and bring another person along. Because I don't think it's right that we stand alone. I think that we should stand together. Um, so if we're gonna make, share space, and we want real movement forward, all of us need to learn how to share space and share power. And so um, I invited Marissa Ring, she's our real advocate at and Marissa has some things that she wants to say. All right. Thanks, Leanne, for inviting me, and we'll be here for sharing space with me. I love being here with all of you, and I want to talk about who's not here. 
So in my work, I'm engaging with survivors of gender-based violence. And I do that at Dub New Again, our emergency shelter, and out in the community. And I also do that at two correctional facilities. So Indigenous women and women of color experience not only higher rates of that gender-based violence, but also much higher rates of incarceration than our peers. And the women that I work with teach me so much. They inspire me and encourage me, so it hurts that we can't be here together. It's also important to me that we remember another group of women who can't be here. So I'm marching for Sheila St. Clair, for Rose Down Wind, and all missing and murdered Indigenous women. Miu, miigwech. So I, I said I was going to share two stories, and this last one is really to get us ready to march. So a few years ago, I was a part of a team of women who started an organization to grow women's leadership. The Battle of Rua, Flory Jantopo, Sue Hakes, Melita Spears, Leanne Johnson, Beth Peterson, and myself started RAIL, the Rural American Indigenous Leadership. One of the first things that we did was we talked about what values did we want to guide us. Uh, we knew that we were going to face challenges. We knew that we would probably disagree at some point. We wanted to craft a statement that we that we that would guide us through those times. And um, Rail reads this at the beginning of every meeting, and we're going to read it now. So Marissa, Cayman, and I are going to read it. So we open and end in a circle because of our belief in each other. We are nonpartisan, and believe we all have a place at the table. When we work together, we include each other and welcome others into our work. We create safe space and respect for each other in our actions, listening, and interactions. We are curious to learn more and share what we learn with others. We value questions and mistakes as ways to learn more deeply. We are willing to learn from each other and open to challenges. We are here to build our group, our power, our knowledge, and relationships with ourselves and our rural and indigenous communities. We bring wisdom, maturity, and youthful insight to our work. We are aware we bring a strong cultural perspective with us as we are diverse and we come from a wealth of life practices and experiences. This is our strength. We create community. We accept conflict as a means to understand each other more. We choose to respond openly and address issues with the courage to be truthful and use our voice. We are all leaders. We laugh in the face of oppression, and we have a mission to lead in new ways. We're the new leadership. We always close our meeting with this, storm the gates. And so I'm going to ask you all right now to say it with us. Storm the gates! All right, let's march. I do, I do. Um, you know what? Danny, I need the Rory girl here. You know? 
Welcome everyone, welcome! I just want to real quickly invite anyone who needs to have a better view of our sign language interpreter, please come forward if you cho so choose. My heart is full. So many people to thank. <laughs> and so much love and so much gratitude today. Uh, I want to start by thanking the original organizers of the Duluth Women's March starting in 2017, Janet Nelson, Kathy Wright, and Candy Geary. <laughs> And I want to thank members of the Feminist Action Collective for their work in bringing us together this year. I also want to take a moment to thank all the individuals, all of the women, all of the communities, the organizations in our community who have continuously, over time, fought for justice and equal rights, human rights and equity and love in our community. We want you to know, many of you are, are here, I'm seeing faces in the crowd who have been doing this for so long in our community and have really paved the way for all of us. And so I just want you to know that we honor you today and you have our love and our gratitude. I do want to thank our sign language interpreter, Emily Engel. And our peace marshals, who have been led by Veterans for Peace, Socialist Action, the Loaves and Fishes community, and Beth Bartlett. Thank you. I'm just going to be real brief because we have some amazing, powerful women here to share with us today. Sometimes I have to look to the natural world around us to make sense of the chaos. And I know, I can only speak for myself, this last two years throughout the campaign and now this administration, there has been a constant cycle of grief, there's been anger, there's been a sense of hopelessness sometimes. There's been a sense of hope, power, community, and it's cycling through all of it on every level for the last two years straight. How many of you, how many of you have experienced the grief? Yes. Fear. Yes. Right? And so just, just for a second, just for a second, we have so many fighters here. And I, we fight and we fight and we fight and we fight and we fight against the oppression and the insanity. Just for a second, let's just take a deep breath in and let's put that fight down. We're safe. Just for a sec. Right now we are in safe community with each other. And we can put down that fight just for now. And then we can pick our work back up. We can pick our work back up together. And I look to the natural world and I think about the cliffs up the shore and these huge rocks, right? And I marvel at them and I marvel at the power of the waves that roll in and they crash against the rocks. And it's, there's so much energy and power in those waves. And I see us here together today as that cliff and that rock. And you see those waves of oppression and hatred and racism and violence against women and children and bigotry, all of it, those waves are gonna keep coming and they have power, right? We know that. But what happens when they reach us as the rock? They break. 
they break. And they're gonna keep coming. They're gonna keep coming. But when we stand in the beauty of our truth and what we know to be good and what we know to be right, those waves are gonna give us some jagged edges. They're gonna polish, they're gonna bring out the polished beauty that we have, right? But they're gonna break, and why are they gonna break? Because we will not move. And so, I am so honored to be asked to participate today, and I am so honored to be standing up here with these powerful women. <laughs> and I just want to introduce first our wonderful leader of our beautiful city, Mayor Emily Larson. <laughs> And I have to tell you, you are a stunning crowd today. Um, so I actually, I want to, I want to get y'all in a picture. And actually, for real though, if everyone who has a sign could just lift it up, because I'm going to show you later what you look like, because it is beautiful. I do some meditation in the morning, and I was reminded of one of my favorite quotes by Eleanor Roosevelt. And I'm going to paraphrase it because I think our call to be inclusive while this is a women's march and I am not going to shy away from the work we have as women and as communities, I do hear the call to be inclusive. So I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit and I'm going to say that people don't know how tough they are. They are like tea bags, actually. This is how it starts. People are like tea bags. And they don't know how strong they are until you put them in hot water. <laughs> so here is what I say to our leaders across the state, to our president in the White House, bring on the boil. <laughs> Last year we showed as a community that we care about the voices of people in Duluth, that we as a community stand united to ensure that there are opportunities for women and girls. And I have seen our activism and our voice be effective time and time again. And this year we are back because we know our work is not done. And we know that the work of creating space and opportunity and pushing women forward is good for girls and it is good for women and it is good for mothers and it is good for grandmothers and it is also good for boys and sons and fathers and men. for people who identify as multi-gender, or gender fluid, or transgender. Because when we push space, we create it for all of us. So what I am here to say today is thank you, thank you, thank you for reminding us as one policymaker here, but we are all policymakers here, for reminding us how important it is that we keep marching, we keep showing up, we keep pushing, and I say again, bring on the boil. We have got this. So keep it up, keep marching, keep lifting, keep sign waving, keep it up. We need us more than ever, and we've got this. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. I want to introduce another very powerful woman. A woman, a woman, she's a mover and a shaker across the bridge over in Superior, where I now live, where I grew up. Uh, please help us welcome Superior City Councilor Jenny Van Sickle. Well, hi everyone. Thank you, Mayor Larson, and thank you to the organizers, um, and thank you all for being here today. Um, you know, earlier this week I did prepare something to share today. Um, but after a particularly challenging week, I reached out to a friend and sent her a message after a pretty genuine and heartfelt speech she delivered. 
I'd like to share it with you guys today because I know how much strength is in this crowd. Dear Liz, sometimes we spend so much time serving and accommodating and inspiring people, we forget to talk about the emotional toll because we're strong, right? It's an honor and a privilege to hold elected office, so much so that we rarely talk about the fight, the stress, the division and the factions that will materialize and organize against us. Because women make good targets, right? For the traditional decision makers to attack, to discredit us. A loud voice that begs for equity and compassion. Repeatedly, I'm told by political forces asking for me to speak in whispers. I feel boxed in. Your words reminded me about why I ran and why this fight is important, even when it's overwhelming hurtful or just too real. Thank you for being in this. Thank you for being someone I can find strength in. I want to finish with hearing our voices today is not optional. Democracy is not optional. Courage is a choice. Leadership is a choice. I ask that you continue to allow me to join you in both. Thank you. We can never discount the importance of the role that art and spoken word play in our community and in our the challenges that we face. And so it is my uh, pleasure to introduce an amazing young artist in our community, Ms. Janetta Paul. Wow, there's so many people making me a little nervous. Okay, today I will be reciting a piece that I wrote myself called I Am A Woman. I am a woman. I am not just the mother to your children. I am not just the woman who cooks your food. I am a woman. I am not just the woman who does your laundry. I am a woman. You think you have won this war with your masculinity? No. I won with my feminist. I'm a soldier. I'm an activist. I'm a fighter. You have awoken a beast inside of me. It will live on long after I'm gone. It will live on in my sisters, my mothers, my cousins, my niece, my daughters. No mountaintop is high enough to hide your valley. No deep, no valley is deep enough to cover your body. No sniper is good enough to take me out. I will prey upon you as if I am a lion. You shall become my prey. Me and my people will feast off your flesh and bones. Do not just assume that a black woman is being loud when she tries to get her point across. You will hear her. You will hear me. You do not know loud. Loud is sound of my people protesting for you to stop killing us. Loud is the sound of immigrants crossing the border. You do not know loud. Loud is the sound of a trans woman voice fighting for her rights as a woman. You do not know loud. Loud is the sound of... Loud is the sound of... <laughs> loud is the sound of Jews escaping concentration camp. You do not know loud. If you listen closely enough, you can hear the sound of my people coming for revenge. Thank you. Wow. I need a minute. Ooh. Oh, so powerful. We also have the power of educators, wonderful educators, women educators in our community. And it is my pleasure to introduce next Urshia Khan. She is Associate Professor of Computer Science at UMD. Please help welcome Urshia Khan. Thank you, everybody. I must start by saying that, you know, all of you impress me so much that I'm totally intimidated and extremely nervous. <laughs> so I have to read. I would like to first of all thank Andrea and all of you for giving me, a Muslim, a chance to speak at the Women's March. <laughs> the collective term, woman, does not 
consists of solely one type of person. Women are comprised of different races, religion, culture, sexuality, and so much more. But what we do hold in common is the desire for equality. I'm so very thankful to be given this opportunity to speak to you all here today. An opportunity that's not often given to Muslim women. I know the phrase, Muslim woman conjures the image of a suppressed female. There are many prejudices that men in societies have against women. Based on these societies, for centuries, women have been treated like second-class citizens. In societies where women have been working as hard, if not harder than men, to maintain and sustain these societies. These prejudices have devalued women and their status in the society. Different societies have different prejudices. In more religious and traditional societies, women um, are seen less than men in moral issues. In modern and developed societies, women are considered less intellectually. There are rumors floating around about women that my very existence debunks. For example, there are rumors that women can do mathematics. I teach mathematics. <laughs> There are rumors floating around that women can do computer science. I do cutting edge research at the intersection of computer science and healthcare. Often the physical strength of men is directly translated into leadership ability. There are rumors that women cannot be good leaders. I come from a foreign country and I was the dean of a school of business and technology. There are rumors that women cannot be independent. Really? <laughs> it is a reflection of the backwardness of the society that women have to prove themselves over and over again and again. It is a tragedy that in a democratic society, men and women are not treated equally in workplace, home, and in the culture. Women in some countries are not allowed to acquire education. This is not because they can't. This is because men are afraid that these women are going to find out about their rights and fight for those rights like we are doing today. These men are also afraid these women are going to outsmart them if they are given a chance and the knowledge. My religion is also maligned for treating women poorly. But let me tell you that many Muslim majority countries have elected women as head of states. For example, Turkey, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Indonesia, Senegal, Kosovo, Kyrgyzstan, and Mali several times repeatedly. And we have never done that so. Even once, the oldest democracy, we have the longest opportunity in terms of time. From our president's locker room talk to Harry, um, Harvey Weinstein's shenanigans, it is apparent that the entire political system has no respect for women. This is absolutely unacceptable. It has to change. Women like Margaret Thatcher, Indira Gandhi, and Michelle Obama are heroic and inspiring figures for all of us. You all standing here listening to me give me hope for a better America, a place which where our daughters can feel safe and be capable. The journey towards equality is nowhere near finished. Together we are capable of change. Moments like these will help bring the change. Thank you so much. I promised myself I wasn't gonna swear today, but... <laughs> These women are bad ass. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. She is the creative director of Blackbird Revolt. She is also an associate prof assistant professor of graphic design at UMD, one of our beloved educators in our community. Please help me welcome Teresa Hardaway. Hi folks. I'm glad it's cold so that if I shake, you think I'm just cold and not nervous. So when I first considered moving here to Duluth, I, I didn't know what to expect. With only 1.9% of the population being black, I, I didn't know if I was going to find a community that's going to accept all of my identities. 
But I didn't really have much of a choice. See, my move wasn't because I just had the liberty to do so, but rather because I was seeking liberation. From an ex-husband, a manipulator, a liar, and a physical and emotional abuser of five and a half years. And it was a pivotal experience in my life because I found out just how much of a badass I really am. How much strength it takes to become the survivor of domestic violence while living in a system that blames the victim. And while my story has much to do with the, the power dynamics made comfortable through patriarchy and sexism, it's really rooted in white supremacy. My ex's actions were a direct result of him being socialized in an environment that values white supremacy. This, this plague is deeply embedded and it affects all of our communities with its domination and control, its elimination of opportunities, and its whitewashed selective memory. During my experience, I was forced into silence. I passed up opportunities so that my partner wouldn't feel um, intimidated by my success. Because of this plague of white supremacy, I forgot my identity. I forgot what I was capable of and that I had a history of black women who have survived and will continue to survive in this fight for representation and liber liberation. <laughs> Excuse me if I side-eye your white feminism, or I backhand your white privilege to touch my hair, or if I reject your Christianity that discriminates against non-binary genders and trans folk, or if I roll my eyes at your ability to say thank you without investing in what I do, or I call you out for expecting me to know everything about blackness while sitting in the same ill-informed history classes as you. censored. I refuse to be controlled. I refuse to be accepted as a woman even in this space without the acknowledgement of my blackness. And I refuse to, to believe that you don't have the ability to change your actions, your words, your thoughts, your spending habits, and your determination and dedication in this fight in a system that affects all of us. Thank you. Next, I want to introduce a member of our community, a badass woman, who, in this beautiful physical environment that we live in, is one of our environmental protectors. She's an aquatic ecologist. She's an educator. Please help me welcome Andrea Kraus. Hey, folks. Um, I, I, can't, I can't say enough how much of an honor it is to be up here with these, these people, a little bit intimidating to follow the, the words that have been spoken already. Um, so thank you all for being here. Without you, this would not be an event. Um, and thanks to our speakers, too. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. I was, um, I was pretty young when I first noticed I was, I was different from other girls. Um, outside of the culture and I saw that first with my gender. I was more interested in playing like a boy than dating them. I wanted the respect they gave each other, the independence and the strength that at the time their gender represented to me. And as I got older I realized I was also envious that they got to date girls. <laughs> By the time I was 12 I was spending time somewhat covertly in the Duluth Public Library in the sexuality section. Um, this was pre-internet time, of course. I still vividly recalling going downtown and buying an issue of the Advocate magazine, a gay magazine from Journey's bookstore. Um, I remember Linda asked if I wanted a paper bag for it, and my answer of no was just a cover at the time for the anxiousness I felt, but I carried it out onto the street, into the bus stop, and I read it cover to cover, over and over, soaking in the images, in the words, 
And in those pages and in the other books I was reading, I saw myself reflected in the stories about gay and lesbian people, and I began to develop a new and evolving vocabulary for who I am. As a young queer person, I was well aware of being outside the dominant culture. I was careful to monitor my language in certain crowds, choosing pronouns, speaking about the future relationships I hope to have. And because of my religious upbringing, I spent many nights laying awake in conversations, trying to convince myself and other people that I was a good person probably not predestined to eternal damnation. By the time I was in high school, I was pretty open about my sexuality, and this is also when I began to recognize my own privilege. I was able-bodied. I came from a loving home. My parents traveled here from Spooner today to be here. Um, I have a wide circle of supportive, thoughtful friends. And I've got white skin, gave me access and safety that I continued to see was not being equitably distributed. This awareness was growing alongside my identity as a cultural outsider. And I watched with embarrassment and disgust as classmates abused that same privilege and justifiably earned the nickname Cake Eater. But I saw that privilege as a responsibility and an opportunity. That gave me a point of traction to push back on a culture that was not just or compassionate. And I learned that I felt strongest when I stood up for what I believed in, rocking the boat around me when people were complacent. We don't know when we're on the edge of a watershed moment for change, but we have to keep pushing for it. I never imagined that marriage equality would be a possibility. I saw the Defense of Marriage Act and Don't Ask, Don't Tell passed by Democratic leadership. Nevertheless, we persisted in politics, learning to phone bank, door knock, going out and getting out the vote for candidates I believed in, working on the Vote No campaign in Minnesota. As part of that, we shared personal stories to change hearts and minds of people who wish to ban same-sex marriage. Honestly, I was pessimistic and quite annoyed that Minnesota voters might choose to disregard the validity of my love and the love of so many I cared about. But instead, Minnesota became the first state by popular vote to reject a ban on same-sex marriage. <laughs> the very next year, Governor Dayton, who had won in a recount election, it had been so close, signed a bill legalizing same-sex marriage in Minnesota. <laughs> One year after fighting off a ban, we suddenly had the right to marry in Minnesota. And two years after that, as you know, the Supreme Court made marriage equality the law of the land. <laughs> When I was making those calls and having conversations for the Vote No campaign, I didn't know how close we were to this seismic social shift. And I didn't think that my vote years earlier in previous elections would have had such a profound personal impact on my life. But it did. We have a lot of work ahead. We have to keep talking to each other and sharing the stories of who we are and listening to those stories. We have to see those shared threads of our humanity woven through our individual personal experiences. So I'm asking you to work on developing your voice. Find the vocabulary to express your truth and let that evolve. Vote and get others to vote as well. Learn how to caucus. There's a training this afternoon. If you have safety and privilege, use it. Use it to push for justice and inclusivity in your workplaces and social circles. Rock the boat. Don't be afraid to make people uncomfortable if they are getting complacent. We don't know when we're... <laughs> We don't know when we're reach the, reaching the tipping point for social change, and these last couple of years have been exceptionally difficult and disheartening and outright dangerous for many of us. But this community can be a point of traction for pushing for bigger social change that's going to ripple out beyond the shores of Lake Superior. 
Many of you have been a part of forming who I am and a part of forming the community we want to see. So let's keep pushing together alongside so many of these organizations and people here today. Join that effort in whatever way you can to protect the people and places we love with your voice and your vote. Show up for Doe for Utero on Saturday, Sunday at uh, Hoops Brewing as one way to uh, raise money for the, the Building for Women and Women's Health, Care, Health Center. Um, come to the Feminist Action Collective meetings. Go to organizations that are here today, Grandmothers for Peace. Support the Loaves and Fishes community. So many, so many people that I, I'm grateful for. But we need your voice to help create the community we all want to live in. So thanks for being here. And speaking of voices, I want to introduce Sarah Thompson. <laughs> Someone for decades who has been using her voice, articulate, playful, beautiful, and strong to push for social change. So to wrap up the program today and to send you on your way, I am honored to present someone who warms my heart every time I see her, Sarah Thompson. <laughs> And my place is in the home And my home is a whole wide world We are world shapers, we are change makers We are potters spinning clay We are dreamers of a new day we are asking questions, we are opening up the door We are searching, finding answers, we are wisdom seeking more Rabbi, singer, teacher, professor, poet, preacher Driving buses, styling hair, we are everywhere And this is where I need everybody singing We are women, try that We. We are stirring the pot, we are keeping the fire hot, we are holding a child's hand, we are the rhythms of the land. We are world shapers, we are change makers, we are potters spinning clay, we are dreamers of a new day. We are packing lunches, we are sewing the clothes you wear We are sleeping on park benches, we are kneeling down in prayer Doctor, dancer, scientist, carpenter and journalist Telling stories, rocking chairs, we are everywhere We are women, we are sweeping the hearth we are dreaming in the dark, we are weaving at the loom, we are the rhythms of the moon. We are world shapers, we are change makers, we are tenders of the earth, we are women giving birth. We are laughing, crying, we are taking the time to play. We are singing, we are sighing, we are making our own way. Politician, volunteer, refugee and engineer, in the streets and on the air. We are everywhere. We are women. We are sweeping the hearth. We are dreaming in the dark, we are weaving at the loom, we are the rhythms of the moon. We are world shapers, we are change makers, we are potters spinning clay, we are dreamers of the new day. We are rule breakers, we are home makers, we are healers of the earth, we are midwives at the birth. We are women, one more. We 
and our place is in the home and our home where is it is a whole wide world Thank you all. I have uh, um, one more song to send uh, send us out today, and this was inspired in part by I was at a poetry writing workshop with Palestinian American um, poet, the wonderful Naomi Shihab Nye, um, and <clears throat> working on poetry. And um, she said, write about something that's just happened recently, like you know, yesterday. And and uh, the day before, I'd gotten a call from um, my wife Paula. And there were too many roosters in our uh, in our hen house, <laughs> and she was in tears because they were they were ganging up on the hens. And um, so <clears throat> anyway, the combination came up with this, and I leave uh, leave you all with this. But I need you um, just to help out on a on a couple things. So I, when I sing, what the cluck cluck we gonna do? Your part is organize a chicken coop. So just try that once. What Cluck, cluck, we gonna do? Organize a chicken coop. Too many roosters in the White House. Cocks, crow, feathers, a fluff. All the hens have had enough. Bare necked, feathers pecked, hope wrecked, blood specked. What the cluck, cluck, we gonna do? Organize a chicken coop. Flock together, eyes on the prize. Flap, fly. Rise, we know exactly what to do. We are many, they are few. We gotta feather up and get down. Run the roosters out of town. What the cluck cluck we gonna do? Organize a chicken coop. There are too many foxes in the hen house. Dressed up suit and sly, sneaky grins, flashy tie. Steal the eggs, cut off the legs, rights and rags, truth and gags. What the cluck cluck we gonna do? Organize a chicken coop. Flock together, eyes on the prize. Flap, fly, up prize. We know exactly what to do. We are men and they are few. We got a feather up and get down, run the roosters out of town. Cluck, cluck, we gonna do Organize a chicken coop yeah. Thank you all We are women We are sweeping the hearth We are dreaming in the dark We are weaving at the loom We are the rhythms of the moon We are world shapers We are change makers We are tenders of the earth